Thank you uh, for allowing me to come back and uh, present again this year. Uh, I talked last year um, to a group about uh, some of the many WSO2 products that we've been uh, looking at and evaluating and things that we were wanting to use uh, with our customer. Um, and I, I guess I should uh, start out by explaining a little bit about uh, why as a, as a partner, WSO2 partner, I'm here for a customer story. Uh, not only do we uh, provide uh, support for, from, as a partner of WSO2, but we also have a contract with a uh, large DOD entity um, to, to do all of their uh, services-oriented operation support. And uh, I, I haven't been given specific uh, permission to name the uh, organization that we support. So uh, I would just say that it's a, uh, a large uh, Department of Defense branch and, and we support one of their headquarters. Um, So a little bit about Eagle Technology Group, just real quick. Um, as the slide says here, we're, uh, we're an information technology engineering integration company. Uh, we do large enterprise architectures. Anybody that's familiar with the, the DOD architecture framework, that's a large uh, documentation work that's ongoing constantly. Uh, we also do virtualization, data center solutions, system application design, development, blah, blah, blah. As I said, we're a WSO2 preferred partner and we're also a Microsoft Gold partner. Uh, one of the things that I, I love uh, is this bullet right here, the fact that we bring over 18 years of IT experience uh, per engagement uh, that we're involved with. And so that says a lot for the, uh, the level of uh, technical prowess that our company uh, uh, both attracts and retains. Uh, another thing that's interesting about us is that we're owned by the Native American Modoc tribe from Miami, Miami Oklahoma. Uh, so as such, we get preferred uh, contracting status. Uh, we don't have to uh, bid with a lot of the, the big uh, multinational corporations that uh, have hundreds of thousands of employees. So uh, the big long title uh, and what I wanted to talk about today that is something that's really exciting, that, the exciting work that we've been working on over the past year um, is uh, building up a good configuration management product for all the WSO2 products that we have to deploy and maintain for our customer. Um, and any of you that have done, have done work in configuration management where that was a main thrust for you? No? <laughs> okay. Well, it is an engineering process, and I'm a system engineer, so it's something near and dear to my heart. Uh, the primary goal of configuration management is to maintain the consistency of your configurable items, which affect the, pr the product's performance, functional capabilities, and its physical attributes, things like how much storage space you need for it, how much memory it requires, all those types of things, especially like with a WSO2 product where you're genning, genning it up, each product up inside of a, a JVM. And you set a lot of those parameters in the configuration of the product when you, when you uh, set out to deploy it. And uh, all this uh, you want to do while taking into account the operational concerns. Well, up until last year, we had all this figured out. <laughs> And any of you um, that have ever done a WSO2 product deployment into multiple environments, you know that it can be a bit of a, of a management nightmare trying to keep up with uh, all of the changes you made to what particular configuration files uh, and how that changes from environment to environment, not just host names and ports, but also you know, all sorts of other variables that can come into play like connection strings to databases and things of that nature. Well, we had a good, uh, I guess I would call it a manual process, basically, where we would just painstakingly go through uh, using some open source tools that we still use um, to evaluate the out-of-the-box WSO2 product versus what we had configured. And then we would capture um, the details of all of those items that we were changing in the configuration files and then painstakingly document this into a text file that we called changesmade.txt. Very expressive, but it was pretty clear what was in there. Um, so this was our process for doing our configuration management and making sure that we knew when we got a product and we, we put it uh, into some environment, there was some place you could always go into a folder and see what had been changed from the CAN WSO2 product 
uh, to configure it for where it was living. And as I said, that was our process until along came WUM, the Windows, or the WSO2, <laughs> Windows, WSO2 Update Manager. And uh, this came out just before uh, WSO2 Con last year, last February. I think it was uh, probably December or January, right before that, wasn't it, Andrew? Uh, it was only about a month or two uh, before we came out for that. And um, we had a lot of problems with that because we were used to having these nice, clean, installed uh, instances of many uh, multiple WSO2 products, uh, both in our lab and in our customer's environment. And, uh, and then we would get update patches, and it was just a matter of overlaying a couple of files and maybe changing a parameter here or there in a, in a configuration file. And then we would just, of course, update our changes made text file too, right? Okay, so we had our, you know, we had our manual process, but we were working on it fine, but then we came out with the uh, WSO2 update manager, and this was forcing us to now wipe out that entire implementation of that product instance with all of its configuration and completely reinstall the product from scratch, and then have to go back and painstakingly take all our changes made and change them all again manually. Uh, and then test the, the new product with our changes. And so, uh, as you can imagine, if any of you have been through the same thing, um, you could pr probably feel our pain. We were doing this with, uh, I think, about six w different WSO2 products at the time. Um, at first, it wasn't as much of a pain, and we actually complained about it a little bit at the WSO2 con last February. Um, but uh, was pretty much uh, told that we were, this was a process we we're going to have to live with. And so we went to work thinking about, okay, we're going to have to change our configuration management process here. How can we do this? How can we deal with this? Wiping out the whole instance, reinstalling it, reconfiguring it, and then you know, have it available to, that we could you know, do the same thing in multiple environments even, because we have you know, several different, uh, besides our lab, several different environments we have to deploy the products into. And so, um, as I mentioned before, you know, we, we, we captured those, those uh, previous changes that we were making in the configuration management plans, and um, um, we, we found that um, with the WOM update that WSO2 had put out these puppet scripts hoping to be helpful um, to some of the, the different uh, integrators that had to deploy their products. And that was really nice for customers that could go and buy Puppet or that had internet access. When we're dealing with DOD customers, we have a lot of isolated environments that we have to deal with. And a lot of these environments have no internet access at all. Um, a lot of these environments are very limited on what kind of tools they will allow you to bring into the environment to manage what you have in there. And so that put aside Puppet, Chef, Ansible, anything you can you know, mention that would have helped uh, helped with this effort. And so, like I said, we, we learned to live with it, uh, accept it, and said, okay, let's get to work and roll up our sleeves and look at how it can rework our management, our configuration management process to build deployable WSO2 nodes that are, that are updated and already pre-configured. And uh, when we left the WSO2 con uh, last February, um, they were, they were advising us to script everything you can. That was the best advice they could give us. So that was, uh, that was our starting point. All right. So the title here is, you know, Configuration Management Using Software Development Principles. And uh, um, one of the main... Uh, um, principles of configuration management is that you want to you want to take those configurable items and manage them okay um, so what we did is we started looking at those things that we have to change or that we're configuring for the product to, to um, uh, be deployed for specific functions that we wanted to perform and actually treating that as our source code so what we did was we built a shared repository uh, to hold these configurable items for each product. And some of the advantages we gained from that immediately was uh, 
It allowed all the team members, uh, all, all of our engineers on our team to be able to contribute to those configurable items in a central repository where they could ch check it out, uh, modify it, push it back into the repo, and if somebody else went to modify it, it would say, you know, it would let you know that just like with any other source code, someone else has already modified that, you need to merge with their code or stash what you're working on until you pull that down and then reintegrate it. So it allows us to do team contribution. Uh, we can centrally track all, all the changes to any of the items that are, that are in there uh, by simply, you know, you can even go down to the individual file if you want to and just right click on it and do a repo history and you'll get every change that's been made by any team member on what date it was changed and why it was changed. And it, the, the other thing that's really neat about this is it allows us to do branching while testing, and of course that's neat with source code. What's really cool about configurable items doing this is this allows us to do a, a kind of a sideline configuration change that might implement some new feature that we're thinking of implementing or that we know we're going to need to implement somewhere down the road without modifying our, our, uh, our main branch, okay, what we're deploying right now. And we did this recently with uh, uh, X509 certificates for identity server. And so we, we've already developed all of the changes that we know we're gonna need to implement that when the time comes and it's sitting there parked in our repository in a separate branch until that time that we know we're ready to implement that and we can just merge that into our, uh, our main branch. All right, so these configurable items, what exactly are we actually storing in this repository? Well, when we first started out with a repository of deployed or deployable, let's call them um, WSO2 product nodes that are configured for specific functions, uh, our first bright idea was to just put the entire um, uh, home, you know, the product home folder, and zip it up and put it in the repo. Well, okay, that seemed to make sense, right? Okay, but any of you that's ever worked with these firsthand, you know that these products are probably a half a gig, some of them more than a half a gig in size. So you can imagine if you've got six different products in multiple environments, uh, that repo is gonna get pretty big real quick. <laughs> so in the name of, uh, of storage space, we said, okay, well, what out of this, uh, what out of this, you know, uh, this folder construct here of this you know, deployed uh, instance of a WSO2 product, do we really need to, to save in the repository? Well, of course, just those things that we've changed, things that we've customized. And so that's what these, uh, that's what these configuration files are. We did it in a way that the configuration files are dy dynamically modified, and I'll explain to you a little bit more detail what I mean by that. The other thing we did was, is we set up within our repository a separate folder for certificate key stores. And so what we do is we develop for each environment in which we want to deploy the product a specific set of server uh, key stores for that product. And then each, within our key stores folder, each product has its own, um, uh, I think we have a, a separate environment breakdown from there. And then within each environment, then we have the individual product key stores as well. And then other artifacts as required, these could be things like car files or whatever, if we, if we have specific, um, say, ESB mediations that we, that we have to use for particular services in a particular environment, where we always run some of them through some mediations for um, uh, redirecting them. Um, we can also include car files for, I don't know, endpoint collections, all sorts of things, registry, any, any type of registry artifact, anything you can package in a car file. All right, and then um, what we're able to do here is then we're, the way that we're making this happen is as part of a software build now, is we're actually monitoring uh, the WSO2 product releases using a cron job that runs actually three times a week. So we run it Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday each week and basically just interrogates WOM to see if there are any product updates for any products that we support for our customer. If they are, it automatically pulls them, automatically stages them to a place where we know they are, and it emails everybody in the team that we've got, gotten a new update to API Manager 2.2.0 or whatever, and it's been downloaded successfully. And so we get that information as well. There's times you have problems in your environment where 
who knows, you run out of disk space or whatever, for some reason the source that you've downloaded can't get transferred to that staging area. So not only will we get notification, but notification that a download occurred and that it was copied to the appropriate staging area successfully. Then, uh, uh, like I said, this, uh, this, that's our isolated zone, our staging area. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we can do then when we go to implement this is that uh, we can back up the previous instance that's fully configured, and then when we're ready, deploy the new product release using our configurable items that we stored in our repository, and then we test that fully reconfigured new product against the required capabilities that we were wanting to uh, use it for in a particular environment, okay? And then what we do is, after running those tests, if, if they don't all pass, we of course have to go back and see, okay, what was it about this release that broke that particular test? Or maybe the test broke. Uh, we're using uh, Selenium tests right now, and a lot of our tests are just testing basic capabilities that you might use uh, the management console for normally. And so, uh, something as simple as an update to the management console, maybe they put something on a different tab now or whatever, could theoretically break one of our Selenium tests, and that's actually our biggest challenge right now. It's uh, the main thing that we have that goes wrong uh, between updates that we've had to deal with. But uh, then uh, what we do is after finding those uh, configurable items that we need to update because something broke, we go back and then we redeploy the previous instance, deploy the new product release again, and keep running these tests until we get a clean set of tests for all the capabilities. All right, so what are all the develop, software development principles that we've applied here? We've, we've got a lot of software development background on our team, and uh, so it was kind of natural for us to do this. Uh, one of the things that it does is that WSO2 has preached from day one that, you know, with WSO2, it's configuration as code or configuration over code. I mean, how many of you have heard them, you know, mention that before? Yeah. Um, and so we were like, okay, we'll vote our, we'll uh, just view our configurable items as code. And so we'll do things like uh, put them in a repository, make them self-installing. We have scripts that do that for us. Um, any of the uh, configuration changes that we have to change when we deploy it from one environment to another, we've managed to build into our configurable items such that we can just uh, modify those with environment variables where we're deploying it. There are, I, and I will put one little caveat on there. There are a couple little modules that we found within uh, just about every WSO2 product where that's not entirely possible um, through environment variables. And so what we've had to do is create specific scripts that actually modify those uh, specific entries within uh, those configuration items when we're deploying it. Uh, but it's, it's uh, in essence, the same sort of thing. It's just how we get that environment variable value injected into the configuration file. <clears throat> and so um, we're using a, uh, a job build. We use Jenkins as our, uh, as our continuous integration tool. Uh, we've built, uh, I would say, we have on the order of, Oh, probably about four dozen different build jobs that we have to support all of our environments, um, as well as all the products within each environment. Uh, and we have this set up to, to work on a desired schedule. Um, it could, could evolve to the point to where, with, with a typical software build um, that's based on a repository, we use Git, for instance, um, you can trigger your jobs based on any time an update is pushed, uh, but we do it based on a desired schedule. So uh, we're getting updates sometimes two, three months, two or three times per month, sorry, uh, for certain uh, WSO2 products. And what we're doing is we're trying to do a monthly release of those right now. And so we take the latest one and begin with that and do our download, configure, deploy, and test. And if that passes, then we don't have to worry about the previous two because WSO2 updates through WUM are now accumulative. So um, we've had just a couple instances where we had to back up 
the previous versions received during a month to find out something that broke, but that was not that big of an issue to do so. Um, this is another thing that we've done. We've built a, we've built a series of baseline deploy scripts uh, for each product. And so we have a certain process that we go through for each one of these instances that we deploy. And we, we always do a check, is there a current existing one there? If so, back it up, then unzip the product. There's individual script files to do all of that, okay? And then we go through with that baseline uh, set of script files and customize them for each product, which doesn't take a whole lot of effort now. So, you know, like we, could, we could come online with, you know, half a dozen new WSO2 products that we need to support, and we could apply the same process to them without any, any process, what, you know, any problem whatsoever. And then, as I mentioned, we use, uh, we're using uh, Jenkins for our continuous integration. This allows us to also work towards doing a continual deployment. Um, and, and we're having to do our deployment manually, so um, it's not continuous per se. But we're about 90, 90 to 95% with our customer uh, who is now having us deploy these into a, a, a cloud platform, AWS. Uh, and we're about 95% of being able to, when our tests run 100% clean, being able to actually use a command line interface to upload our uh, pre-built, pre-configured products into S3 bucket for them to deploy to rebuild our, our nodes there. And the last thing that we do is that's a, a software development principle is running the product as a service. Um, this allows it to run in its own space. You can run it with a no log on user in the Linux environment, so it's a lot less hackable. Um, and it's, you know, a lot more uh, secure. Uh, so what this pie chart here is designed to show you is simply what, what we call our deployers, all right? And our deployer is this collection of configurable items that we build for each WSO2 product. And this will have a collection of those basic installation scripts that I talked about, the thing that says check for a backup, unzip the new one, overlay the configurable items. Uh, it also includes, as I mentioned, the key stores for that particular um, product in, in that environment in which we're deploying it as well as those carbon XML and those particular configurable uh, configuration files. Uh, we also deploy a, or include in the deployer, sorry, a, uh, a, a small list of example uh, unit files to set up for running the product as a, uh, um, a service, as well as the uh, environment scripts uh, this has been important to our cloud deployment because it uh, has given our uh, integration support on the cloud environment side uh, good samples of what they need to lay out on their environment before they uh, run our deployers, uh, along with hard examples of what we actually expect in there. Uh, and then, of course, the WSO2 product source itself, which is a big zip file when they're downloaded from WUM. And then we have a placeholder for like backups and things like that. So anybody that's ever worked with uh, like uh, a Git repo or whatever, you know that you can't store empty folders, so you have to have some sort of a placeholder file in there to retain that folder structure in your uh, repository. All right, so I'm getting down here, so I'll try and speed things up a little bit. All right, so our deployers, a deployer is a single consolidated, distributable, compressed file which features the entire folder structure for the product when it's going to be in operational uh, mode. It has a readme text that outlines all the basic environmental requirements for the scripts, for the deployer scripts to run to actually deploy the product. And then we have the actual script files for carrying out the product installation. In our particular instance, we're using Red Hat or CentOS. And then, of course, all the other configurable items that we've already talked about. And the WSO2 product source. And I don't know if you remember the previous pie chart where it kind of looked like maybe all that was equal. This next pie chart here, well, let me go down here, will show you that the product itself is actually about 90, 95 to 99% of the deployer that we actually build and package and put out. 
The nice thing about that is it's all the other stuff here is all that we're keeping in our repository. So the overhead is very low for that. And I wanted to bring up here, this is just one example of, uh, this is a key manager profile for API Manager 210. And this is a typical folder structure of what our deployer would have in it. And you can see that we have our typical config, and this would be the config folder right under the regular, you know, the home, the home folder of the product when you employ it. And as you can see, uh, you have your typical bin in your repository, and then when you get down to your configuration folder, your typical carbon XML, JNDI properties, all of these files that are in here are things that we've customized in some way, shape, or form for this particular product to be deployed into a, a uh, particular environment. And down here are the samples that I talked about with local configs, Red Cedar configs. Red Cedar is our, our personal lab. And then that's uh, just an empty source folder down there at the bottom, which is where when we do our Jenkins uh, build, it'll actually take that zip file from the latest download and put it in there before it packages it all up to put together. So the recent outcomes, uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's been a long, a long haul working on this process and it's not perfect. Uh, we're not 100% there, but we're, we're really close and we're getting comfortable in this process. Um, every month when we do our builds, uh, there's a caveat that if you have any difficulties, that's to be documented. If something seems to take longer than it should have or there's some problem, we look for a way to improve it. Um, but this was good enough that our recent uh, work that we've done for our government customer, customer uh, started last uh, November with a huge migration project of taking all of their on-premise systems and moving them to this cloud platform. And we were one of the programs that were um, picked to do that migration first. Uh, and despite all of the, uh, the, the teaching that we had to do of the engineering company on the platform side of what our requirements were, they, uh, they, we were fortunate that they recognized early on that we were already doing DevOps and that's what they wanted to do. And so they worked with us and um, we helped change a lot of their internal processes that are now making it a lot easier for a lot of the other programs to do their migration. So we were among one of the first systems uh, to get a fully operational suite migrated to their managed cloud platform. We were the first to receive a suite validation, as far as I know, uh, to actually operate the system, meaning we passed all their security uh, requirements. Uh, and as I mentioned, our early success led to uh, us being granted special privileges. They were really impressed with our team. We really had a great uh, rapport with our engineering team on the cloud platform. And so they've given us you know, additional um, leeway to be able to implement additional features, capabilities, and products that we wouldn't have had to, uh, been able to do earlier. And we're now being asked to provide an updated enterprise identity management solution for the entire enterprise. So, that's opened a huge door for us that is long overdue. We've actually been waiting for that for almost two years uh, to be asked to do that. So, uh, And uh, another thing that's been great for us is uh, we feel we've been allowed to show the many advantages of working with open source software um, that a lot of other U.S. government agencies have never been able to uh, really appreciate yet. Even though it's been talked about and they pay lip service to it, the government has been, you know, mainly tied to a lot of the large uh, commercial software companies for a long time. And so this, this exercise has helped us in, in, impress them, press upon them uh, the viability of, of a large open source project and, and, be, and product suite and being able to uh, make it uh, suit the needs of our customer. That's it. Any questions? Yes, sir. Use a microphone. So when you talked about uh, storing the configuration uh, files, the changeme.txt or whatever it was, uh, where were you storing those? Were they in the Git repository? Were they with the project? Did you have a separate repository for that? How did that work? Well, our customer has a repository. They've told us that they've stood up in the cloud, but we haven't been given access to that yet. <laughs> so right now, our repository is in our local lab. Um, we do, have a, a, we do have a cleared facility, which is kind of unique for a lot of government uh, 
software development uh, contractors. Uh, many of them, uh, much to their chagrin, have chosen to do their development exclusively on the government systems in the government environment. And it really hog ties those development teams in a huge way. Uh, we're greatly blessed to be able to have a cleared facility and uh, our, our government uh, representatives full support in doing all the development that we can in our own facility. We work remotely. We don't have to work, up, work on the, on the, uh, the installation. Um, we go there for meetings about once a month maybe and uh, sometimes they come out to us. So we've got, like I said, a, a great working relationship. We've been really, really fortunate. Yes, sir. So the AWS that you mentioned, mm -hmm. is that the private government AWS? And uh, if yes, uh, how up to date that is? Is it private government a AWS? Um, yeah, I guess you would call it that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, government got its own AWS, right? The private. Yeah, one. it's it's. It is not hosted on a government facility, if that's what you mean. It's a, it's, it's a virtual pi private cloud, yes. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much.